Okay, uh, good morning everyone. So today we'll continue for the topic related to the interface charge and the bias temperature instability. So last week we have already brief discussed what would be the, the issues when we have the certain uh, trapping effects in the dielectric. So we have already discussed the interface state, the border trap, the, even the outside uh, charge. And then we start to discuss the different uh, methodologies to characterize, especially focus on interface state. So last week we have been introduced the conductance method, which is, which is one of the most popular method. And another very popular method is also very classical method, it's what we call the charge pumping. And charge pumping is a very old technique that we have been used for a really long, long time, but right now we still employ the charge pumping in the all kinds of different applications. If you look at for the recent five years literature, still many uh, researchers explore the charge pumping in the uh, very advanced uh, semiconductor device. So in here we will really, uh, go through the concept related to the charge pumping. So the left hand side you can see this is the first paper what we mainly uh, discussing with related to the charge pumping in the MOS device. So just uh, for your reference, the first taken uh, knowledge that the, the knowledge we first to come out try to use a charge pumping was a paper published in the nineteen sixty nine. So that was a long long time ago. But that was the first uh, uh concept proposed and then verified at that moment. And after uh, a little bit while in the 1984 so star the uh, at the moment the first author was still the the, the students in the University of Leuven and then later on become the professor and also the uh, professor in the Leuven and then the IMAC so the first author the professor Guido was a at the moment in 1984 he started to summarize uh, more detail related to the charge pumping. So the paper is called Reliable Approach to the Charge Pumping Measurement in MOS Transistor. So that's a paper published in the 1984. So after this publish, uh, people start to have the more systematic way to know how we can further use the charge pumping to characterize interface state. And this paper, although it's already published 1984, it's just the same age, like my age, so it's almost 40 years already, but still become the most uh, important and most classical paper related to charge pumping. If you are the, in the future, need to use uh, charge pumping techniques, you definitely have to uh, study this paper because everything was more systematically starting from this paper. So, um, what is charge pumping? So, the, the method actually is worked for the two steps. The first one is we try to generate the electrons and then we hope the electrons can be captured by the traps. And secondly, we start to pump the holes and because of a hole will be able to recombine with electron. So that's why we will uh, generate the, the recombination current between the electron and holes here. And so we believe this current is proportional to the density of the traps. So the concept is very simple. Of course, we already know there are many, many traps, especially interface trap in the MOS device. So first of all, we try to uh, let the device turn on. We have the electrons start to go through in the interface and then we start to, can, uh, we can observe the electrons are being captured by, the, uh, by this trap. And second stage, we just try to intentionally to pump the holes. So as you know, holes will recombine with electrons in the end become the charge pumping current, generally we call it charge pumping current, and this charge pumping current is certainly proportional to our interface state. So how is a measurement set up? So this is a very 
typical measurement set that we first to apply the pulse generator and we have a sound oscilloscope to uh, record the waveform and then we this is our typical uh, 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 mod fab so we apply a gate pulse and we try to measure the substrate current because substrate current is due to the recombination between the uh, electron and then the hole so that's in there become the substrate current so since we have to apply the the the, the gate pulse so we have to make sure that the the gate region can be applied like the pulse waveform is shown here we have a two phase one is a and one is b so now i believe everyone probably already know what this means for the flat band voltage and then threshold voltage so usually we will apply the gate bias in the beginning to below our threshold voltage so in this case it's below our threshold voltage so that means this is at this moment the MOS device or MOS capacitance is biased at the accumulation. Right, because of now is in the if you still remember the CV curve, now we are biased in the, the left hand side. So now it's in the accumulation. So accumulation, this is a negative bias. So the negative bias that means we will increase our uh, will pull up our band diagram so now we have a uh, lot of the 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 the, the, the interface state will not be filled because right now these all the interface state are above our fermi energy so this is our fermi energy so in the last week we also have it have been discussed uh, the, the uh the traps can be only uh, reactive with our carriers as long as the traps are below our Fermi energy here. So in this case, since our traps are above our energy, our Fermi energy, so that means all the traps here are empty because of uh, uh, the, 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 this one uh, electron is happen around here cannot be filled and second phase is we start to try to bias in the case where the, our gate bias is larger than threshold voltage so this is usually the inversion so that's the inversion uh, region here so in this case we start to see we apply the VG larger than VTH so that's an inversion region and therefore since we start to apply the large VG so that means this interface state star will be accessed by the electrons here because this is our Fermi energy so now our Fermi energy now is above our interface state here so that's why this interface state can start uh, capture the electron. So we have a lot of electron trapping at this moment. So this is uh, the idea that uh, why we have to set up this waveform. Because first of all, it's kind of like we want to have the, the clean state. We want to make sure that uh, all the interface states will not be trapped by the electron so we apply negative bias so now all these interface state are pretty clean there's no electron trapping at this moment but uh, afterwards we try to uh, give a pulse that the induced electron can be captured by this interface state so this is our uh, uh, charge pumping uh, charge pump pumping the ideal a uh, fourth step here that's a, a pretty uh, a brief way to understand what this uh, charge pumping a uh, master here as I say the first one is accumulation so 
all the interface state now is empty because of uh, your EF is above, uh, is uh, your interface state are above your Fermi energy. Now we start to ramp up, so that means we start to advise this uh, MOS device in the uh, inversion region. So we start to have the electron uh, 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 formation here. So this is a situation that the VG uh, approach to VTH. So at this moment, we start to see a gradual increase for our electrons here. So this electron can start to trap by this interface day. And in the third state, which our VG is larger than our VTH here, then in this moment, the electrons, uh, the interface state are, uh, can capture all of the electrons here. So we can see. And then last part is we start to, again, to generate the whole current here. So now we're back to the state where we start to have the holes formation. So we have a holes formation here, which this will lead to the recombination between the electron and holes. So this hole can recombine electron trapping. So therefore we will start to see this charge pumping current as shown in here. And this current will flow to the substrate so we can uh, record this current in the substrate. And therefore that's we call this as a charge pumping current. And then you can see the charge pumping current is proportional to our interface trap density. So, although if you look at, you try to apply the trap pumping in your device, sometimes can be very complicated, but uh, the idea behind here, behind the charge pumping is very simple. So, we in the last day, we will pump the holes here, and then the holes will recombine with electron and forming the charge pumping current. And this charge pumping current will proportional to our NIT. So here is a sum of the experimental result here. This is the degradation after the CCS. CCS it means this is a constant current stress here. So we can see the left hand side is our uh, 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 very regular CV curve here. And this is a one with no stress, which is this one. This is no stress. And then once we stress, after around 4,000 seconds, we can see the CV curve is changed. So this change, that means we start to see the impact come from the interface track here. And these things can be also seen in our charge pumping measurement so in the right hand side this is a charge pumping current versus a different voltage here so now you can see the blue one this is a pre-stress so it's this one so that means this is a fresh and after 
one hundred second stress. We start to see the increase of our charge pumping current become like this way. So then, that means the charge pumping current is increased, and we all know the charge pumping current is proportional to our NIT. So this also suggests our interface uh, trap density is increased. Then the only thing is ma the, ma the major difference between the charge pumping and typical CV measurement is the CV measurement can be only conducted on a capacitance. And then the advantage of charge pumping is we can characterize this phenomenon in the transistor. So if you look at the influence on the MOS performance, so basically we can conclude the impact majorly come from the DIT. For sure the DIT will influence our threshold voltage. And also we can foresee the DIT will influence our mobility, which is mainly due to the coolant scattering here and once we have a coolant scattering that will cause a conductance change and also the drive current will change as well and for sure once we have an impact come from DIT we can see the substance law will become worse and increase in noise so that means once in the future you start to see your, your device uh, that has uh, uh, the, the phenomenon showing this slide and so that also suggests that uh, your device is highly influenced by the interface state DIT here okay so now we finish the interface uh, charge here. Now we move to the next topic called the, the bias temperature instability. And once we consider bias temperature instability, we have to first to understand uh, uh, what would be the general issue of this bias temperature instability. So you can see this is a left hand side, it's a typical CMOS inverter, and the bottom is a MOSFET. So a MOSFET means the device usually is biased when VG larger than zero volt. And the P MOSFET means we need to bias the VG below zero volt here. And we found out that if we uh, continuously bias our a MOSFET with a positive VG with respect to the time, and after a certain while, we will start to see this is a threshold voltage versus a time. So we can see the threshold voltage will start to increase as long as our bias is larger. And also, if we apply the larger bias, then our threshold voltage is increased as well so that's we consider this is because this is bias in the case whether we have the positive gate bias so in this moment we also call this as a positive bias temperature instability that's what we call as a PBTI on the other hand if you look at the case with a P MOSFET here, we were biased in the negative gate bias. Although it's under the negative gate bias, but we can still see our threshold voltage shift as a time increase here. So because this is biased in the case with a negative bias, so that's what we call as a negative bias temperature instability that's what we call the NBTI
And why we call this as a bias temperature instability is because our threshold voltage here, the threshold voltage shift is dependent on our bias also dependent on our temperature. So that's why we consider, we call this, give a general name for this phenomenon, that's what we call as a bias temperature instability. And if you look at the literature in the, the Google Scholar, you can find out that actually this is a very, <coughs> very important and very hot topic that still needs a lot of engineer and researcher try to understand. If you look at this, is a Google Scholar search in 2019. So you can see the BTI, the literature related to BTI is uh, uh, keeping increasing. But uh, this is uh, the, 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 the invited talk that we call the year in review in IRPS, which is uh, one of the most important reliability conference here. But if you look at the, the most recent one for the IRPS 2023, you will, or even the 2024, you will still see the BTI are still the most important uh, reliability charging challenge in the of our semiconductor device. So yesterday I have uh, uploaded some reference and also the, the presentation from the last year, last two years for your reference at the how the, the, the past student, how do they organize presentation, they can organize in all different kind of way and they use a different kind of the material. So basically that's all fine with me. And then I also put some of the uh, uh, important reference for for you if you need more information and also from I also put a one literature just uh, published in this uh, 2024 June so this is a very uh, latest research and that's a topic called uh, gay outside reliability opportunity and challenge so that means this is the outlook of the the, the, the paper related to gay outside reliability. So in that paper, in, this, in that paper, they describe all the recent, the recent learning from the BTI, even also with the TDB. I think it's worth reading because you can understand that the, this is a phenomenon that has been discovered for more than 30, 40 years, but still nowadays we found that, that these things is getting more and more interesting not only for reliability aspect, but also for application aspect. So recently I also read the paper that the, the, the researcher used the BTI, this phenomenon, to be developed as a circuit that has a machine learning application. So that's in general is a very interesting approach. So we can turn on the reliability issue, become the possible applications. So, uh, as we already said, the bias temperature, it depends on our bias. If we apply negative gate bias, that's what we call the NBTI. If we apply the party gate bias, that's what we call the PBTI here. So, what would be the main observation is we will see the threshold voltage or flat band voltage shift with respect to time. And there are lots of the 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 mechanism people try to understand and one of the most uh, easy way but for sure this easy way doesn't mean always true the the, the people try to use uh, interface state to explain why we will have a bti but now in the end actually it is not a complete true because we found that there's a, a lot of things beyond the interface state and also, this degradation is called recovery with the time. So that's because of due to the 
probably due to the detrapping, but not all of them. Sometimes not re- not only limited to related to detrapping as well. And here is a, some of the possible explanation. For example, we might create a positive outside charge. We have a negative outside charge. We have an interface there. But this one can be seen as an example that uh, as long as you change your dielectric, you need to do the BTI again because of the the different dielectric give us a different uh, material property, different band gap, different band of set that are always lead or even a different process that are always leading to the different charging dynamics here. So not only the dielectric, if once again you change the substrate from the silicon to the 2D to the, the compound semiconductor, basically all the BTI has to reconsider again because the mechanical and materials has changed as well. So uh, now it's important once we introduce uh, silicon oxide nitride and also and we have the huge electron trapping phenomenon in the early time for the half oxide under the PBTI. So if you are in the future, if you are in the one of the this, you, your research is related to a bias temperature and stability, no matter in what kind of device, I recommend you can check this uh, professor is from the TU web in the Australia. So, and then in uh, Professor Tiber Grace, I think he spent whole his life working on the BTI. Even nowadays, he's still working on the BTI. So basically, he tried to understand every advance, the issue for related to BTI. Even after a certain time, if you look at back for his uh, student profile, like, like maybe five or 10 years ago, a student even try to start up a company who run our simulation tool or try to understand BTI. So that means understand this reliability is not only understanding, but it can create the opportunity for the application as well. Okay, so here is a sum of the literature that can be interesting to share to the everyone. So this is BTI effects transistor characteristic. So BTI can create defect and charges and that will degrade our electrical results here. So you can see this is a stress time versus our threshold voltage here. And then we can see that we can do the certain modeling here to fit this curve. And then after a moment, we can start to extrapolate the lifetime. So if we set our criteria as a, the maximum criteria that we are okay for our device or for our product, is the threshold voltage is equal to 30 millivolt. And that means in this case, this semiconductor device can only operate around 10 to 4 seconds because once reached with 10 to 4 seconds, the shift of this device will reach these criteria here. So that's also one of the goals when we're doing the reliability because in the end we want to extrapolate lifetime. Of course, 10 to 4 seconds that's a very short time, it's definitely not enough. So that means we need to start to further optimize and enhance the device reliability. So this is another example. After stress, we can see the current degradation. And also after stress, we can see the gain leak current. So that's always very often to see, no matter the device you fabricate in the university or even the commercial device, even the most advanced FinFET, they always suffer these BTI issues. So let's go back to see the, what would be the, the first uh, the paper uh, to identify the 
the BTI. So this is paper published in the 1966 here. And from 1966, it's already observed that the, the y-axis is a flat band voltage. Then, then the x-axis is our applied voltage. So now we can see once we apply the larger voltage, we start to see our, our flat band voltage is shift. So this is an experiment conducting to measure the flat band voltage of MOS cap after 3000 Celsius degree treatment here. So this is a, a NBT. So the NBT means this is a negative bias temperature. But uh, at that moment, back to 1966, uh, this experiment was not conducted with considering the time. So there's no time dependency for this experimental results. But uh, that's already given a sense that uh, in the very, very early time that uh, already we try to bias and we can start to see the shift of our flat band voltage that's uh, start to create a new door for everyone that uh, will try to understand these issues and later on one year later so this is a uh, 1967 this is the first uh, comprehensive study for the N NBT, NBTI and PBTI as well so in this graph they apply the negative gate bias here so we can see the flat band voltage shift to the left of course nowadays we call this as NBTI and this shift to right and nowadays we call this as a PBTI so this experiment was conducted at a relative high temperature beyond 150 Celsius degree now I believe everyone can pretty easy to understand why when we do the reliability we always prefer to try at high temperature and this is because of the, we believe the high temperature can accelerate the degradation so we because we want to see the degradation we want to see the characteristic shift so that's why we always conducted the, the testing on high temperature and this moment was stressed at a very small outside field because that's a long long time ago and also in this paper already start to discuss the service charge and fast interface state and one of the important phenomenon for the BTI is it can be recovery so that also has been already observed in the 1967 and later on in the 2001 so star people explore the different uh, high K material as you know the, the, the history of semiconductor evolution is in the beginning we employ the silicon dioxide but after we try to scale it we found that the, the issue is that SiO2 cannot be scale anymore because due to the high leak current therefore we have to start to replace SiO2 with another high K although high K gives us some advantage for example the, the, the large dielectric constant and we don't have to reduce the thickness but we can keep the same current rating but the, the first issues in the reliability of high K is that we see there's a large PBTI here so the large PBTI that means this is a device suffering a huge trapping effect here so in the early time with the hafenium oxide or aluminum oxide we found out that the, there's a huge PBTI effect and then this is a, in the, the x-axis is a trapping uh, electron density and then in the 
y axis is inject charge density. So inject that means we try to apply the no matter for the curve or bias, try to inject the, the charge inside. And then we can see the trapping density is huge because SiO2 is here. So SiO2 is a case we can inject a lot, but the trapping is small. But now if you look at the high K, like the case with a half new outside, we bias in the relative low, but the shift is already larger. The trapping electron density is larger. So that means this high K material shows a very serious PBTI issue. So this also gives us a certain consideration that uh, reminds us that uh, once in the future, of course, everyone in this classroom, after no matter what you're doing, or now or in the five years later, what you are doing is always uh, one of the most advanced semiconductor technologies here. But uh, just don't forget it, that uh, on the one hand, probably you are trying to optimize the performance. You try to make us a very low SS. You try to make a very high current. You try to make a very large memory window. You try to make the device with a huge, a very high breakdown voltage. So you will incorporate all kinds of the knowledge you might have to change your dielectric, to change your substrate, to change your interface treatment. But just don't forget that on the other hand, you always have to see the effect come from the, the reliability because sometimes the transistor who has the best performance also will exhibit the worst reliability. It's always kind of a trade-off. You can fabricate the device that has an amazing output current, amazing low substantial slope, but usually those devices can also suffer in the worst reliability issue because uh, reliability and performance is always in the trade-off. So you need to certainly to optimize and find a balance point in between. So this is one example at early time, people developed high K, they found that high K is uh, the great candidate to replace SIO2, but unfortunately high K is a uh, material that has easily for the trapping effect. So that's why the first demonstration for Kai K in the literature is early time, but it takes so long to commercialize. It takes so long to become the product because the engineers uh, try to uh, spend so much effort to solve this uh, reliability challenge. So here is a uh, the 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 one for example this is a this is paper is not that old this is already the paper come to the 2014 so it's just a 10 years ago of course 10 years back we believe the high k is a mature technology but uh, you can see this is a first paper this is 2001 who star already discovered the high k is a trapping dielectric that can suffer lots of BTI issue. But take another 10 years, it seems that uh, still not that huge progress. Of course, from these 10 years, we already moved from the certain node to another node, probably already moved to the film fed technology. But uh, after 10 years, still the reliability can be the one of the issues here. So because this is threshold voltage, this is a uh, stress time here. So we can see this is a different bias, VG1 volt up to VG2.5 volt. We increase our bias here. And once our bias increase, our threshold voltage is increased. But now if we try to use uh, the, the, the criteria that we previously talked about to set the lifetime for this device, so if you let's look at the, this literature. This is a paper published in the 2000. So this is a 2000. So at the moment, the criteria is a 30 millivolt. But actually, right nowadays, 
we still set the criteria for 30 millivolt, roughly the same, sometimes 50 millivolt, sometimes 30 millivolt. That depends on your application. But generally, we will set the, the, the criteria below one volt for sure. But uh, if you use this criteria, and now you, could, you look at this is a paper in 2000, criteria for 30 millivolt, the lifetime is only 10 to 4. This is a seconds, not the hours. But now, if you look at this graph, this is 2014. Where is the 30 millivolt? If we, we set the criteria for 30 millivolt, that's here. So that means our device can be only used for the 10 to minus 10 second. So that's extremely short time. So if this is a technology that uh, in your product, that means your product is one second will kill your device. Your product cannot be commercialized for sure because of the lifetime is way too short. Even you try to relax your criteria, relax to the one volt. Where's the one volt? One volt is here. So probably can be okay because it can be saturated and then it can be very, very long, long time to reach one volt. But uh, still, the shift is uh, huge because it's very close to our criteria here. So that means the reliability is uh, always a key issue for the loss of semiconductor technology, especially the very advanced one because because the advanced one also your performance is better because you change the new material, you change to the high K, you change it to the ferrer electric, you change to the 2D, but the, all these material property contains a lot of defect, always cause the trapping issues. So now you can see this is getting more latest one. This is paper published in 2015 and this already the the product that everyone can use in your uh, electronics. So this is based on the 40 nanometer and 22 nanometer uh, uh, technology. So again, this should be the already in the age between the planner or even the film fact. Still the same, we can see after so many years, finally, this is a PBTI result. So finally, we do a lot of efforts. Our engineers, our researchers are so amazing trying to suppress, to overcome this reliability issue. And finally, our PBTI become perfect. Is less than 10 millivolt. So if you consider the criteria we have been talking about for 30 millivolt, finally, we are in the timing we can commercialize our 40 nanometer or 22 nanometer semiconductors if we only consider PBTI. But unfortunately, we can see our MBTI still remains uh, issues here. So our MBTI still remain issue. So this is our MBTI because the shift for NDTI is still beyond the 30 millivolt. But even if you look at the trend for this one, it's kind of like the dramatically increase. Of course, our operation voltage will not be that high because we will try to reduce our power consumption. So we will try to minimize our operation voltage. But still we can see the MBTI remains a concern in advanced device. So once technology is properly optimized, we can see the significant reduction of electron trapping in half an hour side. So that means that we can make it good for our PBTI for our commercial product. But uh, if we talk about MBTI, we still the 
lots of effort to do. So that's why leading to the recent understanding. If you try to look at the BTI in the last three years, but then you have to put the correct keywords, not the BTI in the compound, not BTI in the ferret tree, probably BTI in the silicon, in the advanced FinFact. Everyone is talking about MBTI because the MBTI is still the main issues. Because you might, if you are in the new to the field, you might get confused why that uh, nobody talk about anymore for PBTI. Everyone's why everyone is talking about in the MBTI because that's an issue in the advanced law. But that's only limited to the silicon based device. And one of the another issues for the uh, uh, BTI is recovery. So the recovery is when we try to apply the reverse bias or we don't apply bias, we start to see the, the threshold voltage will shift back. Just like here, this is stress. And no, this is, uh, this is MBTI, so this is under the stress. And once we apply the reverse bias, so this is reverse bias for P MBTI is a positive gate bias. We can see this is a case where you apply the naked gate bias. But if you don't apply bias, it's here. So now the problem is that the, we all know this shift can be recovery. But the problem is that the, we never be able to get the fully recovery. It's always showing the partial recovery. So if we consider partial recovery, that means this is your operation and then you stop, you turn on, turn off your electronics and you start to operation, you turn off, you start to operation, you turn off. So you can see this recovery because we won't be able to get a fully recovery. So that means with a certain overall time, your threshold voltage shift is gradually increased. So that's the issues here. And this is also another, this is a, a threshold voltage shift. This is a, a, the ID set. This is a tool for ID degradation. This is ID degradation. In percentage so we can see the current will be degraded because of due to the threshold voltage shift as well and also the, this is a another this is a pure uh, recovery curve here so after you do the stress you start to monitor the recovery with different bias here and also this uh, recovery is dependent on our voltage and temperature so in any house it's always very sensitive to our bias and temperature so that's why we call this as a BTR but the problem for the recovery is we found out that the, it's kind of like the ultra fast recovery and also it's kind of like an endless recovery so what does it mean the ultra fast the ultra fast is means that this is our experimental result and then we can do some mathematic fitting or do some very advanced characterization so we can even characterize this up to here but problem is that the this is already down to microsecond. So that means you stress, but you just rest for microsecond. It's already has a recovery. So recovery can be fast. That's extremely fast. So it's faster than the microsecond. But also another problem is that since we cannot get the fully recovery but still have the partial recovery so if you have the enough time you just let them keep in recovery it's always has the issue become the endless so that means the recovery will get in slower slower 
but it's always never back to your original zero here. So that's why we call as an endless recovery. It continues for since forever. So that's become the problem is that how do we do the lifetime modeling, right? So one of the goal when we do reliability, not only to do the testing, second, we try to understand, we want to understand mechanism. Once we understand, we possibly can solve these issues or we try to minimize these issues. And the last part is do the modeling because we want to predict the lifetime. But if this always come up like ultra fast recovery and the endless recovery, that becomes the issue is that we have no idea how to do the modeling. And if, if, if we don't have a good modeling, that's become the problem for the circuit designer or system user because they don't know how to predict the characteristic. So that's always uh, the correlation, not only in the device level, but also in the circuit level, also in the system level as well. So here, we talk about some more recent understanding for the origin of the PBTI here. In the past time, we're always thinking about the interface state is an issue. That's an interface state. So that's a, like it's a 20 years ago, 30 years ago understanding. But of course, as you know, the technology is changed all the time. But that means our understanding should be changed all the time as well. So because after a certain moment, we start from the, the interface, they cannot fully explain what we have already uh, seen in the, 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 the degradation. So that's why we start to uh, propose that the, these electrons not only being able to be trapped in the interface state, but also if we have the traps in the dielectric here, it's possible this electron can also be trapped here. That's what we call as a either for border trap or as a, a bar trap here. And in general, is we consider as a, the defects in the dielectric. So the charge trapping in the dielectric can be explained by in the interface state or dielectric defect. And then in this dielectric defect is includes the, the border trap or outside traps here. But uh, once we have the bilayer in the semiconductor, because in the most advanced semiconductor device, we are not only use one a single dielectric, we use uh, several bilayer to be on top of each other because we want to have uh, we want to leverage the advantage of the SiO two, but also we want to have the high K material here. But uh, since we put another high K material, so you can see. As long as you have a new material, it's always a defect. So there's also another defect in the high K material here. So in the end, this electron can be also trapping inside the, the, the high K as well. So in general, we consider this as a dielectric defect because it's always a defect inside the dielectric. It's a defect always inside the dielectric. So that's why we call it as a dielectric defect. So now if you look at the recent five years literature, sometimes I, I know it's getting confused because we are not growing in the timing of this semiconductor develop. We are growing in the timing that semiconductor has de already developed for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, because we are in the middle to start to being involved in this field. So sometimes we don't know the original story behind in the early, early time. So that's why that uh, sometimes you will get confused that uh, there's a one part is always talking about interface, but why in the end we still have to talk about the dielectric effect and then the traps in the dielectric. This is because technology 
is changed all the time and therefore our understanding our mechanism should be changed as well so that means in your semiconductor device in the device you fabricate it might actually in the end has a new mechanism because I know everyone is working on very advanced technology uh, especially most of you the technology you are working on is in the age of the pre-research that means it's not yet labeled in the production or just in the right moment that the company wants to production so that means there's a, so many understanding still need to be revised but it's always good to come back to look at this old literature because that can give us a some some inspiration but by the way this is paper published in 2018 so now again if you look at this so old literature like this one right this is a 1966 so at the moment people only know about the service charge so they think this is due to the service charge but after from 1966 to the 2018 so many things change of course as well as for our semiconductor knowledge here okay and of course the bbti now is if we talk about the silicon based advanced technology we can highly suppress the bbti because we do so much effort to optimize the dielectric but the mbti still remain the questions here so still we need to have the model first we need to have the model to understand mbti and then probably we can come up with uh, some solution and the one of the most famous model for mbti is called reaction diffusion so this is uh, also the early time model that's uh, mainly considered impact come from the nit what's the nit is the interface state this is the interface This is the interface state density or traffic density. So that's a, a similar name it can be uh, come out in the last place. And then at the moment, we believe that the MBTI is due to the diffusion limiting process. So why there's a diffusion? This is because of the, we actually uh, uh, in the uh, silicon interface, we always have the hydrogen terminating dangling bump here so that means we have silicon the bonding between the silicon and hydrogen so this is the dangling bump and the idea is also very simple it's just because with gas the hydrogen can be diffused because hydrogen is a very light atom so that can be easily go to this place and another place so therefore hydrogen diffusion is being proposed to explain the MBTI so the hydrogen can be diffused into the dielectric here so this is uh, and then this is a model proposed in 2003 and this professor is from the Purdue uh, professor Alan and he is also the, the expert in the reliability field so some of my materials here just uh, probably like a 10 percent is also referred to his uh, the online courses in Purdue and then another around 70% is referred to the uh, my previous advisor in the IMAC and K River, Professor Guido Kusenek he already retired because in that moment I in the Ruven I also have a similar class like in here so there will be around 70% also referred to his class material so anyhow this is a uh, the model that the proposed to understand MBTI and people found out that the, the reaction diffusion model has an excellent fit you can see 
if we, once we apply this model, we can have, this is a recovery time versus threshold voltage, and we can have the fitting very well, even down to 10 to minus six uh, seconds. So that's why uh, people think that it's indeed, we might have the issue of the hydrogen diffusion. But at a certain moment, we still, uh, the knowledge is being uh, examined, examined again and then and have to revise at a certain while. And then another moment is uh, the people start to think about that uh, under the NBTI, it can be also, we once we apply the negative gate bias, and then for sure we have the whole reformation here. The whole can be also injected into the dielectric, right? So this model is more consistent to the concept of what we know from PBTI. So this is basically what we call the defect central model here. That means as long as we have the defects in the dielectric here, we always, that can induce, no matter for PBTI or NBTI as well. So in this model, they propose, propose these kinds of a defect bands. So we have a certain defect inside our uh, 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 dielectric. So that will cause the NBTI and PBTI. And BTI is mainly determined by materials and thickness because of the different material that cause the different defect distributions inside the dielectric. Also, the processing will impact the defect density. So this is the idea for this uh, MBTR. And then this is also the dielectric defect, but just in this case, usually they will consider kind of like a distribution here. At a certain moment, very has a huge uh, defect concentration with a certain distribution. So this is a defect distribution. And this defect distribution brings a conclusion in the next line here. That's why if you look at very recent literature, every material, half onion, oxide, anneal, half onion, oxide, half onion, oxide plus aluminum oxide, half onion, oxide, silicon dioxide, silicon oxide nitride. Every dielectric has its own defect distribution. This is defect distribution. This is the one that I'm drawing here. So that means what we need to do is to optimize this defect distribution. And that's become the purpose, the goal for the, uh, the semiconductor engineer. Also, if we talk about in the real circuit, we need to consider it's at the the in real circuit is what we call the dynamic. So dynamic, it means that the, it's not always the MOS operating the party gate bias, it's always on off, on off, on off. So that means the BTI is happen dynamically, not the constantly uh, this appears. So uh, uh, in our uh, real circuit, because the VG larger than VTH or VG smaller than, let's say in the case with MOS fact, they will be the two possible operation here. But the device on, uh, under the constant stress, So actually it's always on off, on off in between. So that's a dynamic operation. And that's why we call this as a dynamic BTI. And once we consider dynamic, that means there is a part 
of timing that we don't give a bias. So therefore, we have a recover, recovery effects. So if you look at this, is a real data come from literature. So because of the, 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 the dynamic that's also had to take into account of the recovery effect. So that means we can see our dynamic BTI is always showing the smaller shift compared to the, 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 the original. This is a conventional static uh, uh, NBTI here. So under dynamic stress condition, the NBTI are smaller than the uh, static. This is because due to the recover, recovery effect. So that's why the recovery is important because once we don't give a bias, it's always seeing the recovery. And then in the case with MBTI, luckily under the real operation, dynamic MBTI is better, is much stable than the static MBTI. So therefore, if we try to trouble the lifetime, this is static, this is dynamic here. So we can see with the considered criteria of the 30 millivolt and then if we use a dynamic MBTI as a criteria so we can have a 1.2 volt of the operation for 10 years so that's a good because 1.2 volt if we talk about the advanced semiconductor of course this is paper come from 2003 so probably at the moment the technology is very old but if you talk about right nowadays in the very advanced below 5 nanometer what we wish to operate is below 1 volt so that means if 1 volt device can guarantee for 1.2 volt for 10 years so that's showing that our product is perfect, it's very stable also we have some acceleration model that give us a case to ship uh, to do the estimation. So this just uh, give you the concept because the model is uh, there are so many variety of the models in the literature. <coughs> so the idea is just um, we have the different experimental data. We do the fitting to the time that we are interested in. So in this case, we are interested in the ten years lifetime. And we found out that our operation voltage is a 1.3 volt. So that means as long as we are doing, we are operating our device below 1.3 volt, ideally our device can operate more than 10 years. And in this case, this is a 10%. So that means that they define as long as you shift more than 10%, they consider as a fail. So it's a very a uh, tough criteria. Okay, so this is the end of our BTI interface charge. And then we will take a break and then we'll move on to the next topic for the TDB.
Okay, so we'll continue for the next topic, which is a time-dependent dielectric breakdown. And then, actually, this one that we have already uh, uh, briefly discussed the issue and then the, the possible mechanism. But for sure, that's not enough. So we need to go through the, the, the uh, more details. So, as we already know, the time-dependent dielectric down that in short we call the TDDB. And in this case, because if we change the material again, and then all the TDB phenomena were slightly different, but just try to be more systematically and then to understand the whole knowledge breakdown. So in here, we will use, we only discuss the case with SiO2. And also, we only discuss this in the silicon MOSFET because that will be uh, relative to simplify the, 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 the inconsistency because if we look at all the other advanced material, 3.5, Germania, whatever, so on, and then the, the mechanism is way too complicated. Sometimes those are the pretty new technology that the, even the understanding hasn't reached the consensus, but the, the silicon base that we have been studying for in the last 60 years, so the knowledge in here, we, I believe, is more comprehensive and then the consistent. Okay, so first of all, this is our line. We'll talk about phenomena, we'll talk about tasks, and then also we'll start to talk about breakdown. And most important, it's a statistic, so that's why in the early lecture we spend the effort to understand the statistic because now we are going to use those statistics to analyze the TDB case. And those ones, outside degradation, and then we have outside breakdown model, and also one of the important part is acceleration model because in the end we need to extrapolate the lifetime it's always a goal that we want to know <coughs> that our device can survive for how long and whether this time is enough that for our product or not. So this is a phenomenon. So uh, usually the outside breakdown is a time dependent phenomenon where we have been already shown, but here I just show a draw again, that uh, usually if we characterize our MOSFET, uh, in addition to the IDVG, the another one that is very important is what we call the IGVG. So in that case, uh, the, usually if we have very good dielectric quality. We always has a very low leakage current here. But the issue is that this is this phenomenon, this characterization, legs of the time dependency. But now, if we try to do the similar testing, but uh, try to plot the gate current versus the time, we start to see, this is a case under the positive gate bias. We start to see the curve first increase, decrease. At a certain moment, we start to see the huge increase here. And this huge increase, suggest this huge increase suggests for the heart breakdown phenomenon and because the current increase very fast and then that means this dielectric is no longer insulating
because the purpose for dielectrics we want to have is a uh, want to have the perfect insulating property but nowadays we don't have insulating properties anymore so dielectric breakdown it means a sudden loss of the insulating property of the dielectric layer after electrical stress here of course when we try to understand the tddb not only we care about the last part where the current is shooting and then we see the hard breakdown but actually we also very interesting in this region because this region also tell us something this is region not just like the curve goes up and down but just uh, not like the the the, the inference come from the measurement machine this curve actually suggests that the, the reason why we have this current decrease is because we have a negative charge injection We will talk about this later, but just want to let you know that the, the every curve you characterize in your own device, I believe every small detail has a some physical base meaning. So you should not just uh, ignore them. But if you try to take some passions in your own characterization, your own curve, probably you can find out something that nobody has discovered before so in the case of TDB we see the current decreasing that means this is a negative charge injections so this is a very typical curve for the TDB and after TDB if we try to conduct in this emission microscopy that we call as a ME measurement you can start to see less uh, the bright spot happen in here or in here the bright spot means that uh, the, you have a huge current go through this part this location and that will also can be sensed by this emission microscopy so that's the uh, evidence of our dielectric breakdown so that means it's in the once you have hard breakdown you can see the certain place where you have a very high current go through this and you can see this effect from the emission microscopy so therefore the emission microscopy is a very powerful way to understand the TDB also anything related to the current uh, uh, induced values okay so that's a phenomenon and second next one is a test so when we test for sure that we have a many many different test methodology and one of the interesting is what we call the ramping voltage test so the ramping voltage test is that we will actually when you do the measurement you can adjust the speed when you do the uh, 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 sweeping for example 1 volt to 5 volt you can adjust the speed so in this set in this case we can change the the speed here so that's what we call the voltage ramp and if you try to uh, change the voltage speed you usually will see the effects like here you have the ig vg if you apply the case with a 10 volt per second so 10 volt per second that means this is slow so you you only increase your voltage 10 volt per one second you see your breakdown like here but if you apply the case of a 100 volt per second that's fast because every second the voltage has to increase 100 volt then you will see the breakdown curve like this way this already start to imply as a, our dilation breakdown is a time dependency because this is 10 volt per second that means you stress pretty longer to reach to the breakdown voltage 
But the 100 volt per second, that means you uh, sweep very fast to reach your breakdown voltage. And then the difference here is related to the stress time. So that's already start to imply our semiconductor dietary breakdown has a time dependency. And usually we will uh, uh, set a different trigger current and one of the important for the TDDB uh, testing is that this breakdown is destructive. So destructive means that the, once the hard breakdown happens, it's, your device is completely broken. It's a uh, fail anymore. So you cannot use the device. So you actually try to destroy your device, start to see this TDDB phenomena here. So that's the first very often used technique for the RAM voltage test. And here is a sum of the, 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 the result here. So you can see that uh, the right hand side is a 2.5 volt per second. So that's a fast case. So the fast case give us a high breakdown, but slow case give us a lower breakdown. So that's already implied that the, when we characterize our device, you should be careful about how do you set up your split, how do you set up your step. Usually it's uh, not sure by every machine we can change the speed, but how we easily to manipulate the split is we change the step. For example, one volt to five volt, if you change it to one volt per step, but if one volt to five volt, you change it to 0 0.1 volt per step and use a timer to count the swimming time, you found out that the swimming time is a huge difference. And once we do the ramp voltage step, we can start to uh, 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 do the, all of the statistics summary here by using the histogram here. So basically we can see that we test for the, this is a test for 340 device and then we can see it's clearly exhibit as a three kinds of the type here so we have a type a that device broken at the relative low field type b the device broken in the middle field and also the type c this is a device broken in the 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 high field and actually the type a and type b are the issues more related to the processing. For example, defects. So usually we consider this as uh, extrinsic reliability. On the other hand, uh, for example, we can see the type A can be defects, defects here. So all kinds of defects, contaminations, metal, roughness, whatever. So that's always cause uh, the extrinsic reliability. But uh, what we really interesting in is the uh, type C, because type C is an uh, intrinsic breakdown because uh, we are really test the device, the dielectric breakdown, because this is under the consider that we don't have the inference from defects, it purely depends on our dielectric properties here. So this is intrinsic reliability. So when we talk about the TDDB, we are more interested, more interested in the intrinsic reliability because the intrinsic reliability is completely reflect the material property, the strength of our SIO2. Um, but the extrinsic reliability is because we're due to a defect and defect can be further optimized if we have a better process control. But the fundamental issues that will be still related to the dielectric strength here. And 
During the TDDB test, we have two different ways. One is what we call the constant voltage stress. Another one is called the constant stress stress. So the constant voltage stress, that's what we should call as a CVS. So which is the case with stress VG. We, uh, 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 we apply the gate voltage. But uh, when we uh, conduct the constant stress, that's with stress current, the IG here. So this will lead into the different phenomenon here. For example, you can see in the CCS, of course, this is half right down, but in the second phase, this is a one because we have a negative charge accumulate that will cause the current decrease. But if you look at the CCS, it's a different way because we stress the current. So we wreck the voltage versus the time here. And if we consider a simple equation, voltage is equal to current times resistivity. So once the device, the dielectric is broken, broken that means it's losing its uh, insulating property, so the resistivity. Resistivity will decrease, so that means the voltage will decrease. So at the moment, this this is a time that has a huge voltage drop. That's also indicate as a hard breakdown as well. So here is a some more detail for the CVS. So CVS, this is a to simplify the this is a, the the early time uh, discussion. So at the moment, to simplify the 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 situation, that's many use. Uh, we have the one piece of the SIO2 and on top we have a two in here they use a silicon but in anyhow it's a anode and we have the castle here so since we apply the constant voltage stress so this is a Average field is a constant. So in that first case uh, that we can see there's a certain castle field increase and then the current is increased. And then the second phase we start to see there's a negative charges accumulate and therefore we start to see the current decrease because of negative charges accumulate. And similarly, we can use the same concept to understand the CCX here. And here we will uh, skip this one so you can study by yourself. That's a very similar concept. And to quantify the TDDB, we must to have a certain uh, parameters that we can do the measurement or calculation and therefore the first one we uh, propose is what we call the charge to break down which is a QBD here so basically we can see the degradation is scaled with the charge here so that means if we Uh, if we have the device, we have a dielectric that can contain the lower TBD and that will also have the curve like show me here. This is because we have a lower, because a higher current. So if you consider the charge, it's the same. Charge is equal to current times uh, your time. So that means if you have a higher current, so your T will be decreased. So that's you see the lower TBD. And what does TBD? TBD is here. TBD is what we call the time to break down.
So the QBD is a one of the main breakdown figure of Mary for the for evaluating the dielectric TDDB stress. But then now we have the issues is that the, if we try to scale in the R size thickness, we have the MOSFET here. We have a source stream. We apply the gate bias, or we apply the substrate bias. So therefore, we can consider as a two-way of injection of a charge. One is from the gate. That's what we call the gate injection. Because we apply the gate bias, so we inject the charge from the gate side, or we imply we apply the negative substrate bias, so we 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 inject the charge from the substrate side, so that's what we call the substrate injection. And we found out that if we consider the dielectric is very thick. And then the y axis is the charge to break down. So it doesn't matter with uh, uh, gate injection or substrate injection. But uh, once we do the scaling further and further more, we see the difference. This is a gate injection, it's a reduced, but substrate injection still maintain high. So that means the QBD it's not a good figure of memory anymore because it has a polarity dependency. That's what depends on you. Either do the gate injection or substrate injections here. So that's why that the later on we will probably not use the charge breakdown. We will use the time to break down as a one of the figure of memory. And we have a different testing structure here. So to test the, the different time uh, region of our dielectric, we can design the different testing structure. The first one is, for example, the area intensity because of uh, we have the large area in between. So that's many to check the area breakdown or we can have the isolation age intensity. So this is isolation region. So that's a just try to check the weak point at the isolation age. Or the third one is the gate. So we can check the weak point at the gate age, which is here. So, and the last one is the gate to isolation intensive. So in any how we can design all kinds of the different uh, structure to test the dielectric strength in the area that we are interested in. Now we move to the breakdown statistic. As we already said, the reliability is a theme that combines three things. The first one, the probability that the item will perform a required function, stay condition, and stay period of time. So that's a reliability. And if you consider thin outside, if we want to have thin outside with the excellent reliability, this thin outside must act as a great insulator. And also, Stress the same thing with the comparable voltage current temperature in the normal operation conditions. And last one is a good lifetime. So that's the purpose. If we want to claim our dielectric good enough, then it must have these three properties. And we have already discussed the difference between a log normal and weighable. So in here, we don't have to show this again, but this is just a slide to remind us that uh, we can use, we need to use the statistic data to analyze the TDDB. 
So the left hand side is a typical histogram. So in the histogram, we can divide by two types. One is extrinsic breakdown. Another one is the intrinsic breakdown. So basically, the, the x axis is a TBD. So the time to break down is a statistical dispute parameter which can be represented in histogram or this is the one we are more interested in it's called the cumulative distribution function CDF so this is a CDF so and if you look at try to compare this data with a different fitting and clearly shows that the variable distribution can fit our experimental data very well. So the variable state is regarded as the most common function to describe the distributed data in the sense of the TDDB testing. In most of the literature, you will only know they use the Weibo, but probably very limited literature will still discuss why the Weibo can be applied in the case of TTB. If of course, it's not just only the Weibo distribution can fit well, but fundamentally, there's a key concept that we already mentioned. This fitting can get very well because of the weakest link. Due to this weakest link property, that's why the variable distribution can fit very well. And surprisingly, if you try to look at, this is a dielectric breakdown that the people have been proposed for the more than 60 years to use the Weibo. But the amazing thing is that the, if you go deeper and deeper in the semiconductor field with the distribution analysis, you will find out that the, the Weibo distribution is actually very powerful. Because if you look at the last five years, people use the Weibo distribution to analyze almost everything. Uh, ferroelectric switching. If you are working in the ferroelectric device, you know the ferroelectric has a dipole switching. So, dipole switching has a random characteristic because you don't know where the di the dipole can be exactly switched. So, the dipole switching has a also similar concept like a random happen. That also can be fitted with a Weibo, and also, uh, substrate breakdown. In here, we only talk about dielectric breakdown, but actually, lots of people use a substrate breakdown to a uh, substrate uh, to analyze the substrate statistic and use uh, uh, the 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 variable distribution to fit the substrate uh, breakdown as well. So anyhow, the variable distribution is uh, very powerful that can be applied in the lots of fields. And here is a. Uh, the, the, the reason that why the, 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 the low normal is worse than the Weibo because the low normal will lead to the overestimate the result in here and therefore the Weibo distribution is better to have the nice fitting. Weibo distribution has a nice fitting. And then in the Weibo distribution, we have the two, uh, several parameters. First of all, the X axis can be QBD or TBD. So QBD or TBD is a Weibo distributed. And also we have the shape factor here. That's what we call the beta. So this is a one in here.
And once we consider the variable distribution data, that's all including the intrinsic and extrinsic, then we can actually start to understand something more in detail. For the, this graph, because this, this is, as I say, this is a distribution data. And distribution data are very located in the one specific time. So that means this is a region where we have a very narrow distribution, we have very tight distribution. So if you try to plot the distribution here, you can see the this is a percentage versus uh, this is in the time domain between 10 to 4 and 10 to 5. So this is a 10 to 4, 10 to 5 seconds and the curve are very narrow. So that's indicate this is a narrow distribution. Because this is important, you probably know how to process to make the wave of plot, but in the end you still need to convert back to the typical knowledge to understand how we can in interpret the wave of plot. So in this case, if you see the plot has a very steep slope in the one specific time, that always suggests that the, it has a very narrow distribution. And because this is very steep, so that means we have a large beta. So already mentioned the shape factor is here. So this is beta. But now if beta becomes very steep, so that means we have a large beta here. And on the other hand, for because of it, it has very um, very narrow distribution in the one specific timing, so we can consider that's an intrinsic breakdown. But on the other hand, if you look at the, another extremely extreme case that the, you have the time to failure that's a, have a very widely distributed from 10 to minus 1 to 10 to minus 4. That means if you convert back for this plot where y is percentage but now your x is starting from 10 to minus 1 to 10 to minus 4 then we have very wide distribution here. And also, if you look at the shape factor here, that gives us a very small beta. So, the small beta here suggests for the wide distribution. That's a small beta is a shape parameter from wave plot, but that's also in the meantime indicate that we have very wide distributions in our device here. So we have a two breakdown modes here. One is intrinsic, another one is extrinsic. And extrinsic is usually the it is a a uh, uh, critical reliability problem because of uh, but uh, the extrinsic can be only measured if a gate area is uh, sufficient larger. So the reason is that uh, if you have a small area here, as already mentioned, the extrinsic is mainly due to the defect. So. If you have only small area, you probably your areas will only include one defect. 
But now, if you have the huge area, then we have the lots of defect being included in here. So that's why. If you want to see the phenomenon of the extrinsic, we need to make our device as a larger to, to make sure that the device actually cover lots of defects. So here is a some of the summary that possible cause for the extrinsic breakdown here and then the conclusion is mainly related to the process induced defects. So once we have the extrinsic reliability and then uh, this extrinsic reliability is strongly process dependent, is localized weakness and small fraction so we need to see this effect in the big device and also this is important it's a very wide statistical spread spread here because of a, we can see the timing here it's a huge spanning from here to here and there's a one model pathway to consider for the extrinsic reliability so if we have a defect inside the dielectric and actually the effective outside scene is become thinner so the enhanced intrinsic breakdown in the effective outside scene is so in overall what this model proposes is that the, once you have the defect then your effective outside scene is become your original t ox minus t defect And the next one is a system. When we talk about the system, we also have been discussed in a previous statistic, just a quickly go through again that uh, to analyze the TDB, we need to have considered the series system because the series system is a uh, system four is any one of the component force fails. System fail is any one of the component fails. Then you can see the previous discussion and we can apply this in our concept try to understand the area dependency of the tbd here so if we have the different area one is a1 another is a2 here and this is a consider for our dielectric we have the dielectric here source Drag. and then this is a cross section so we have the area like here so the air a1 is a total area and then the a2 is a small area and we want to understand the correlation of these two areas in terms of weighable plot here so we apply the series rule and we do the calculation and they will come up with this one so this is a weighable plot for the big area this is a weighable this is FA1 this is FA2 and difference between these weibo plot has uh, this dependency so in the end the conclusion is once we consider the area scaling from one area to the another area actually the distribution will shift vertical vertically with uh, uh, factor of a natural log a1 over a2 so here is a result so you can see this is a 
This is A1, this is A2. A1 is big Y, A2 is small Y. And this is a changing from A1, A2. It's a vertical shift of the natural log A1 over A2. This one. So that's a main meaning why we have to understand. I believe you see this uh, example will be much clearly why we have to apply the previous knowledge because now the correlation between A1 and A2 is a natural law of A1 and A2 here. Because natural law A over 0, 0, 002 is equal to natural law 400 here. And also, by using this skill, we can actually start to, this is a small area until the big area, and each one has a natural log of A1, A2, with all this area information, what we can do is we can shift everything align with a small one here because we have all this area information and in the end we can have this one in the end what we actually want to target is shift this respect to small one shift this respect to small one shift this respect to small one and finally we can construct the Wavel plot from the small time scale 0 0.01 second to the 1000 second here and that give us a way to extract the Weibo slope with a high accuracy and also this is this is a good way to identify the different mechanism as well because the slope is a different here we have this kind of the shape parameter here we have this kind of the shape parameter that's a beta 2 so we know from this graph beta 1 larger than beta 2 that's also in the case that the device breakdown in this time domain has a one TDB mechanism, but the device breakdown in this one domain has another breakdown mechanism, and these are all very consistent with what we already know between the intrinsic and extrinsic because this is based on a small area so we can understand probably intrinsic can be happen and this is based on the big device so extrinsic can be happen so in any how in the end finally we can start to use this statistic tool to give us a sense of our reliability mechanism we cannot exactly uh, understand the physics behind but this mathematic tool give us a way to guess okay right now we know all these suffer the one mechanism all these suffer another mechanism but that's already very powerful because that's in the case that uh, we cannot always use all these four to study because we have to separate, we have to consider the, the different mechanism and then try to understand each. So that's a main goal for the Weibo plot, not only to build up for the mathematic and statistical uh, analysis, but it there is give us a hint how to further understand the reliability mechanism.
Okay, so the next one is the outside degradation. So outside degradation is somehow that we also already mentioned in the BTI as well. But the same concept because the interface charge BTI is when we apply gate bias, we start to see the charge injected. But also TDV is similar. We apply bias, we see, see the charge injection, we see the outside degradation. So degradation usually is a structural damage generate in the outside. And breakdown is triggered when the accumulate damage become too large. So there are five outside degradation here. The first one and two is the one we have been already discussed. That's mainly related to BTI. And then the three, four, five are the main one can be related to TDDB. So the three is called the whole friends. The four is called the neutral electron trap generation. Because this, why we call the neutral trap is because the, at the moment, the defect is neither negative nor the positive charge. It's a neutral, so that's why we call it neutral trap. And the last one is the stress-induced leakage current. So the first one, the whole fluence. Whole fluence is based on the anode-hole injection model, where we have also discussed before, is that we apply the VG bias. And we start to have the FN tunneling here. And once we have an FN tunneling, the carrier move here with a very high energy. So the, this high energy will be released to the other alternate in the end, have the whole creations here. And because we apply the party bias here, the hole will be pushed back. We have a party bias here. We have a hole here. So hole will be pushed back. And then the hole pushed back will damage the dielectric. So that's a main thing for the inner hole injection or hole fluence. That's why we see that this one will degrade our dielectric because the hole, why we call it hole fluence? Because there's a hole injection here. The hole injection will here will damage dielectric. So inject electron reach the anode with a high energy and can generate holes that can turn back to the castle. And we found out that the, under the these uh, the, 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 the breakdown at the breakdown here, so this is a region where you have a trap density, and this is your electron fluence. That means how much electron you inject inside. And it's always once reach the certain critical neutral trap density, we start to see the breakdown will happen. So this is breakdown. So even at a very low field, this is low field, and this is high field. So even when we neutral trap density at a low field, reach the critical uh, 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 level here, critical level of the trap density. We start to see the breakdown. And based on this, this is a trap density. And this, based on this phenomenon, we come up with a model, what we call the population model here. And this is uh, the, 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 the consideration with, uh, this is FN tunneling, this is SHE, that's a substrate hard hole, electron injection here. So that's the first 
why in the later we will talk about population model. But the idea is mainly because we found out that even the low field, once it reaches a critical chart density, we will start to see the breakdown. So the anaerobic injection model has been already discussed that we have a four different step here. The first one inject electrons here. Energy release a hole. Second, the hole generation and four trap generations create the electron traps here. And also, once we apply the enough high electric field, we can also start to have a trap generation as well. So the electron field itself induces self energy directly to the outside and cause electron trap generation. That's here. So the electric field not only induces anode injection, but the itself can also create a trap in the outside. And also, as we already say, in the BTI, there's a model called the reaction diffusion is related to the hydrogen release model. So that's why we also feel the hydrogen can also uh, generate a trap. So the next is a stress-induced leak current. So the stress-induced leak current is because of the, the layers of, usually we call the silk, so the silk is an additional current component on top of add on the FN tunneling created by the trap assistant tunneling from the castle to the anode side. So that means if you look at the band diagram here, You have the FN tunneling, which everyone should know. That's a one of the tunneling mechanism. But now, if we have a defect inside, so electron can be jumped to this defect, jump to the other one. In the end, jump out. So that's the steel. This will become, this is the trap assistant tunneling here. So this will become additional current component. So here is uh, some of the example. You can see this is during the constant current stress with a different level. And after stress, we measure the IG VG again. And this is a fresh. And this is seal. Because after each stress, you measure the IG VG again, you see the current increase. So that's due to the seal. The silk rise continuously with injected fluids here. And also we see the one-to-one -one correlation between the silk and neutral trap density. So the x-axis is here is a trap density. And the y-axis is a current. And we see the very one-to-one -one correlation. So since neutral trap density reach critical value at the breakdown, silk also will be used to as a degradation monitor and predictor. So we can use a silk already to uh, predict the dielectric breakdown because that's already give us a hint that we start to have a defect in the dielectric and then we should be worried about this. So finally, we have a summary here. In the case of the uh, TDDB, either we do the CVS, constant voltage stress, or we do the constant current stress, we always see the outside degradation, which is due to the generation of a neutron 
neutral electron traps. So in a, another word, just a defect. And then we start to see once the critical trap density is reached, the breakdown will happen. And therefore we propose a population model. That to describe the TDB. So in the next week, we will start to move in to the detail of what does population model. So ideally for the measure model is here. That's why we already show that the, 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 the defect that's going through in the one dielectric form electric path that's called the TDB. And then the first thought why we lead to this uh, idea is because of uh, due to the critical trap density here. Okay, so uh, ideally I should stop earlier because I hope that we can have a, you can you guys can have a time for the discussion. But we still have a ten minutes earlier. So if you need to walk with your teammate, I still still can have some time here. So we will have the group presentation next week. So you need to you need to uh, uh, send me the slide. Uh, I think I made the already information by 9 p.m. So next week we have the presentation here for BTI interface trap. So now either you can use the time right now or you can find your time afterwards to discuss with team math. But the things, just one thing I want to remind us that uh, uh, I know those information, these are the information combined with uh, more than 30 years experience, even this experience that uh, even older, this knowledge is older my age. So it's very difficult to explain everything in detail with just uh, one or two hours. But the idea is that uh, to give everyone chance because everyone here going to be in the future as a great engineer. You need to have the capability to explore the knowledge by yourself you need to have the capabilities to learn by yourself. So you cannot expect the, the professor or your future manager, your boss will teach you anything, everything for you, you have to learn. So that's a good opportunity. Try to learn by yourself. There's lots of abundant material in the online. You can find a lot of YouTube, talk about the trap, talk about TDB. So, and also I know the slide in my side is not perfect because this all come from the lots of old literature. Some of the graph is not, not nicely drawing, but you can use your own way to draw. And another useful way to explain it clearly, you don't have to present everything. You can just pick up certain topic, expand to a 20 minute, that's enough. And also some people, some students, might also search the BTI or TDB that's related to your field. I know everyone here working on lots of different domain. I believe lots of domain all have this issue. You can also put some of the recent literature that uh, in your own field, but also people facing this problem. I think that would be also interesting, not only for your own can be helped for your own research, but also will be interesting for me to learn something more. Okay, that's all. We will see each other next week.